Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to the Library Commission's uh, Table Topics Lecture Series. This is the first in our new version of our lecture series. Um, today we have Dr. Rick DeShazo, who is going to tell us about um, the South's central role in the beginnings of scientific racism. So um, let's see. Let me tell you about Dr. Rick who might sound familiar to a lot of you, his voice and his name. Uh, he's a professor of medicine at uh, Uniformed Services University, Tulane, South Alabama and UMMC, chair at South Alabama and UMMC. He's active in many profession, professional organizations and has published many scientific articles. On air host and co-producer of Southern Remedy Programming for 13 years, and that's why he sounds so familiar to you. Um, he's done many years of work on racial reconciliation in medicine, which is the topic of our talk today. Um, he's published The Racial Divide in American Medicine uh, that's now available in paperback. And here's what it looks like in hardback. We are giving away a copy of the book today. Um, so if you're on Facebook and would like to be eligible, please put your name in the comments. I think that will work. Hopefully we have staff watching who will figure this out. Um, and let me know who the winner is at the end. Um, he's now a professor emeritus from UMMC and professor of medicine at UA UAB, working with medical students and helping develop a new curriculum in health equity. He has three children, six grandchildren, and one wife, Gloria, of 53 years. And he loves to garden and listen to Silver. So we are so happy to have you today, uh, Dr. Rick. Um, and are you ready to roll? I'll, I'll get the PowerPoint ready if you are. We are. Okay. okay. Are you seeing that? Great. Thanks. Well, it's, uh, it's great to uh, be with you today and uh, to go over a, some material that I have developed since I wrote the book, but it's congruent with what's in the book. And um, so let me tell you a little bit about how I got started on this. I am a rheumatologist allergist uh, who trained in both medicine and pediatrics and have had a very um, active clinical practice as well as teaching for uh, most of my career. And uh, so, uh, but one of the reasons that I got into medicine uh, was because I was trying to figure out what I had learned as a child seemed to be broken about it. And maybe I could make a contribution to fixing it. And it all started with my mom, who's shown on the first slide. Um, <clears throat> uh, and there she is. Her name was Agnes DeShazo, and she was a dental hygienist in Birmingham uh, for over 50 years. Um, and uh, I didn't see much of her. She worked very, very long hours um, and uh, was uh, in a very active uh, dental practice and not, not far from her home in Norwood. And I was basically raised by our housekeeper uh, Miss Mary Alice Rice, who you see there on the right, who was made sure I read the Bible every day, had a prayer time, and also uh, did my homework. And so that was pretty important because I was an only child, and uh, it was good for me to have a second mother at home. Now, mother took Miss Mary to the dental office on weekends. Uh, because she had terrible teeth, and uh, I would frequently go with the, with the two of them, and we would go sneak in the back of the dental building at, on the weekends through the back door, and she would work on Mary's teeth. In fact, she ended up having to pull all of Mary's teeth because they were so uh, in such bad shape. Now, fortunately, she uh, found a pair of false teeth 
that the dentist had made for a lady who died before she ever picked them up and somehow bent them around to fix Miss Mary's teeth and uh, mouth so she was able to to eat. The only problem is we couldn't get her to wear them except on the weekends when she went to church because she wanted to look good and around the house she wouldn't wear them. So she uh, often looked like we weren't taking very good care of her because she didn't have any teeth. But I couldn't figure out why uh, I was going to the dentist all the time for checkups and regular dental care. And Miss Mary had to go in the back door. Uh, as a seven-year-old child in elementary school, I found that very strange. And I didn't realize at the time that uh, uh, there were no black dentists in Birmingham until later, and the white dentist in uh, Birmingham would not see her just because of her skin color. So at least she got a little bit of care, but that certainly bothered me a lot. And then on Christmas night in 1958, the next slide, uh, we were finishing up our Christmas dinner and all of a sudden we heard this terrible explosion and uh, there was a black community right behind, actually neighboring our community and right behind the public school I attended called Collegeville. And it was Christmas night, 1958, that the Ku Klux Klan blew up uh, Reverend Fred, Fred Shuttlesworth's house, the Birmingham airport is named for him, uh, and part of his church because he had taken his daughter uh, to Phillips High School to try to get her enrolled uh, in that school, the school I subsequently went to high school. And as a result of that, uh, his home was blown up and his church was blown up and he was threatened. Uh, he kept working all the way through the civil rights movement and, and became a civil rights icon. Uh, so if you look at, next slide, if you look at uh, the health of Mississippi and Alabama uh, and the rest of the old states of the Confederacy, you'll see that the health rankings uh, are pretty much the same. That is, if you look on the left, this is a graph that shows the rankings, uh, a very accurate uh, algorithm is used to calculate the rankings of the health of the people of each state. And you'll notice that th this for the last 20 years in Alabama and the same curve in Mississippi, we trade uh, places for last place uh, one year after another. Uh, the health has been the worst. And uh, uh, so, so why do people in Mississippi have among the worst health of anybody in the United States? Well, it's not just, it's not just any people. Uh, it's uh, African Americans more than, uh, than whites and African-American males worse than anybody. And if you look at on the right, you'll see the survival curves. There's about a seven year difference in survival between whites and blacks in Mississippi and Alabama have been seven years of life lost uh, because of these health differences. And although black females are catching up with black, uh, with white females, uh, the differences between black males and white males uh, and black males and uh, white females remain extraordinarily large. So this, this is what we call health disparities. Uh, and in the next slide, you see uh, the statistical associations between six groups of factors that have been shown to be uh, statistically associated with good health or poor health. And so uh, if you're healthy, you probably have economic stability, uh, a physical environment that is 
uh, not threatening and safe. You probably have some degree of education. Uh, you probably are not anxious about getting something to eat. You probably have a supportive community and you don't feel discriminated against. Uh, and there are systems to help you if you get in trouble and you have health access. And if you're in a poor community, you probably don't have these things or you have some mixture or absences of some of these things. It's interesting that the social determinant of health, and that's what these things are called, they're very important in analyzing what we do to improve health. The one that is most uh, associated with good health is, what would you guess? Education. That's a surprise to me, but that's the way it is. And education is reflective of all the other social determinants of health. And as you know, in the Gulf South, uh, we continue to have a highly uh, segregated education system. Uh, the whites are in academies, the blacks are in uh, poorly functional public school systems and uh, that, are, that are not well supported and certainly not well run. And uh, so there is a connection there uh, that is worth keeping in mind as we go forward. Next slide. So there are, here's a picture of two white guys and a black guy. And uh, the two on the left are doctors. And one of them, this guy, Sir William Osler, is, uh, uh, is an icon of uh, medicine in general. The doctor in the middle was a uh, general practitioner in Huntsville, Alabama. And I think you've heard of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was um, the head of the Re Racial Reconciliation uh, Commission in South Africa at the end of apartheid uh, when there was about to be a civil war. And he stepped in and developed this uh, system to, to, uh, to prevent that uh, civil war, a system of racial reconciliation based on uh, listening, uh, re remembering what had happened, uh, giving forgiveness, but not forgetting uh, what had happened. And so William Osler uh, thought that medicine should be uh, equanimous, that it should be open to all practitioners, uh, and uh, he thought it should be scientifically based. And he wrote an essay about this physician, uh, John Bassett, uh, and praised him for the fact that he had gone to France uh, to study uh, and had become a master of science, a level of scientific understanding rare in people who were not in academic institutions. But he didn't mention anything about his empathy, his ability to put himself in the place of those he served, or any of the usual personal characteristics uh, that we would, we would like to see in some, a doctor taking care of us. And I'll tie that together for you as we go through the uh, Osler's uh, ideas, Bassett's praise, and Archbishop's Tutu's peacekeeping, and his book, uh, which is worth reading if you haven't, uh, which is titled uh, uh, No, P no, no uh, Future Without Forgiveness. It's a great book and, and discusses a little bit about his formula, which was used in the Greenboro Massacre in North Carolina in those communities there, and we're using it here in Alabama now. Next slide. So those physicians should certainly not discriminate or have bias against anyone that they see. That's a part of our ethics codes and, um, and, and what we're taught in medical school. So here's a study from one of our better journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, you've heard about it. And several years ago, 
they, uh, they uh, did a study on about 700 doctors, primary care doctors, who were at a convention and they randomly picked them out uh, to participate in this study in which they were presented case histories, stories, uh, about four people and given the pictures of these four people in random order over a period of uh, a week with some other uh, case histories. So they wouldn't figure out what was going on. And the history was that these people were, uh, had symptoms of a heart attack. And when we see people with symptoms of a heart attack, chest pain that radiates to the left shoulder or sh in women, severe shortness of breath or uh, fainting episodes, uh, what we do is we get some kind of diagnostic study, uh, but we refer them for a diagnostic study. Either primary care doctors refer people with that kind, those kinds of symptoms to a cardiologist, usually get cardiac catheterization or some kind of diagnostic study to figure out if they're having a heart attack so that they can be treated appropriately. So the bottom line of this study was, is that uh, this group of doctors referred white men, this white guy, for uh, 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 consultation and diagnosis more than this white woman uh, uh, and less frequently for this black woman and even less fre frequently for um, for uh, the, uh, I've lost the picture. You, you still have it? Maybe it's just me. I've got the picture if the rest of the audience can see it. Yes, it's, it's up. Okay, I wonder why, I guess I got knocked off with a phone call. Uh, anyway, uh, I've got the slides in front of me, so we'll just presume you're proceeding on. So uh, what happened is, is that uh, the women and the blacks uh, got referred less than the men, uh, the white folks in general. And so you had a rank order of bias against uh, women and blacks. And this, this study uh, was highly statistically significant. There's no doubt that this was a true finding. Now what your interpretation of the finding was is another issue. But most of us have interpreted this uh, as evidence of what's called implicit bias uh, against patients. And these, this is a form of bias that is culturally incorporated into all of us by our environment. And we may not be even aware of it. Uh, and so that seems to be uh, uh, the explanation for this now that there are numerous uh, other studies as well uh, that support that. Uh, in the next slide, uh, which is one on uh, the connection between health status and issues of race, uh, you'll see there's a book and the book is Race, Racism and Science. It is a, a book if you happen to be interested in, in the topic that I'm talking about and want to learn more of, about it, uh, you will find it very interesting. And what it does is it traces the origin uh, of bias and racism uh, in uh, world history. And to make a long story short, uh, the authors conclude, and this is a conclusion like the bias data that I showed you previously has been backed up by others and other studies that the kind of racism that we ended up with in the Gulf South, uh, chattel slavery, uh, followed by explicit, followed by implicit bias, and we'll talk about these, actually was not common was not a part of civilization 
until the Spanish Inquisition took place and began in 1478. That same period when the uh, Spanish bureaucracy, uh, the, the uh, king and queen of Spain were working with the, ch the Catholic Church to cleanse uh, the Catholic faith, they established an, uh, a commission uh, that uh, carried out pretty some pretty awful things against uh, Protestants and Jews who actually um, decided to convert. So there were a number of Jews and Protestants who were uh, either uh, run out of the area or executed during this period. And this was the first time that there was sanctioned uh, racism against people on the basis of color or faith. Uh, in, in previous history and Roman history and Greek history, there certainly was slavery, but there was slaveries where slaves usually had a pathway to get out of slavery. And this kind of slavery that uh, developed because at the same time, this approach to people who were not a part of the majority uh, was taking place at the same time that uh, colonialism was developing because of the exploration of the Spanish and Portuguese fleets and their finding that they, uh, that, that they could uh, take uh, uh, African slaves from North uh, West uh, uh, Africa and sell them uh, to those who were uh, building uh, plantations in the Caribbean uh, and to people in the new colonies of the Americas. In fact, slavery was introduced uh, into Jamestown in 1619 and was very much a part of our colonization here in this country uh, and used uh, by the Puritans to develop um, tobacco plantations in New England. So that was, that was, that's items one, two, and three on this list. The third item is that when the U.S. Constitution uh, was the first U U.S. Constitution was uh, written in 1789. There was a great fight over whether slavery should be continued in this country, and um, and and some of this had to do with the uh, anthropological studies that were being done in slave uh, holding countries. Uh, uh, and colonies uh, about who Africans were and the origins of man. And to make a long story short, the uh, academic uh, programs in anthropology developed out of this period of trying to understand where man came from. Most of them originated in France, but uh, as institutions uh, of higher learning developed in America, there was an American School of Anthropology, which developed about the same time as uh, the abolition movement for slavery was developing in the United States. And it was co-opted uh, by pro-slavery elements, and we'll talk about that going forward. And that's number five, development of medical anthropology and pseudoscience. And then, of course, you're quite aware of the Jim Crow area, era and the civil rights uh, era. So let's move to the next slide, which uh, is something I was surprised to learn. That's the slide with the box on the left and the map on the right. And that box is a cotton gin. 
I always thought cotton gins were these huge things, machines. Uh, well, they're little, they were, when they first came out, there were little boxes you could hand crank. And what was happening uh, in the pre-Civil War areas, a multiplicity of things had happened. <clears throat> Andrew Jackson <clears throat> had run off all the Indian tribes uh, to the west, and there was a huge movement of whites down the Appalachians, from the Appalachians down into these newly opened uh, an, uh, lands in the river bottoms, uh, this rich alluvial plains where you could basically throw seed on top of the ground. It would grow, you know, like Jack and the Beanstalk because these lands had uh, uh, layers of black rich soil like the, bl the Black Belt in Alabama and the the uh, Delta in Mississippi that were seven to eight feet deep from these annual floods that took all the land, all the uh, best lands coming from farms up in uh, the north uh, through the Mississippi system and dumped them down into these uh, southern uh, plains. And so uh, you had the simultaneous abolition uh, movement in the in on the east coast of America with slavery being outlawed in individual cities even though it was still not outlawed nationally uh, large numbers of slaves uh, being sold because the uh, uh, the of this abolition and the fact that the tobacco uh, industry was no longer as profitable new lands being opened and white farmers needing help in clearing these lands and growing them. And the fact that uh, the, uh, the, the industry, the, the textile industry on the East Coast was developing and all that was available to them was the short uh, uh, strain form of cotton rather than the uh, cotton, Egyptian type cotton, a long staple cotton that could be grown in the deltas of Mississippi and Alabama, Arkansas, et cetera. So all of this was uh, the farmers, rather than growing this corn and grains, started growing cotton. And uh, as soon as the uh, cotton gin became available, they could get the uh, all of the seeds out of that cotton very easily just by having people crank it through these little boxes and they were making millions of dollars uh, in fact natchez mississippi was i think the richest town in in, in the u.s uh, mobile became very very rich as did new orleans because slave markets were there and all of these slaves from the east coast were sold off went down the Natchez Trace or went around to Mobile or New Orleans on boats. And you can see the density of slaves that took place in the old Confederacy in this map. Uh, and this map is online, by the way, and it basically shows the migration of slaves. There's about 10 pictures here. This is the picture closest to the Civil War, but the, it, it's light. And then over a period of about 15 years, it becomes darker with the large numbers of slaves there. The next slide uh, reflects this anthropology situation. So the Southerners had a real problem with slavery because they knew that it was wrong. They were very religious people. They could read the Bible uh, and uh, and, and you could tweak the Bible to, if you were a fundamentalist uh, to say that slavery was actually God's plan for people. But the, the way slavery had been set up with, by the Spanish was that uh, these people from Africa were not actually the same species as white people. And because of their, that happened because of their environment. They, they were living in Africa where it was hot and rural and this, that, and the other. 
and they degenerated and that it was to their betterment that they were enslaved and, and given the opportunity to at least feed themselves and not be involved in tribal wars and so forth and so on. That was a justification that the church used uh, to be involved in this process. Well, this, the, 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 the schools that we were talking about began to develop in, in uh, France, England, and the United States. And in the United States, uh, if you look in the 1800s, there was a group, a large group of anthropologists at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, uh, led by a fellow named Morton. <clears throat> and Morton uh, had a number of disciples uh, who, uh, including a man named Knott and another named Glidden, that I'll introduce you to in just a minute. <clears throat> and they all had some kind of connection with slavery. Uh, not in particular was the son of a very prominent South Carolina slaver uh, who uh, was a close colleague of John C. Calhoun, uh, who was a big senator in support of slavery, fought for slavery to be continued in Congress, uh, and promoted the Civil War uh, aspirations of his state when, uh, as a threat, uh, when people, uh, when uh, they tried to pass legislation to uh, get rid of it. Morton had, uh, Morton took a scientific approach to explaining why African Americans were different than whites and therefore they were of a different race. Next slide. And so what he did as you see in this slide, there's a picture of Morton, Morton on the far left, and then there are a bunch of skulls. And so Morton gathered a bunch of skulls uh, from Caucasians, uh, Mongolians who were Asians, uh, Malays who were Asians, American Indians, uh, that's American, and Ethiopians, that's African. Africans, and he uh, he filled the cranium, the front part of the skull, drilled holes in there, and filled it up with uh, with with buckshot, uh, these little round things that you shoot the birds with, and uh, and he then uh, measured, calculated the size of the brains of the various folks. Uh, with using these buckshots. And he concluded that Caucasians had the biggest brains and that blacks had the smallest brains. And this explained why blacks were uh, different than whites. They were not very bright. They were very capable of very little. And they had certain personality uh, 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 characteristics like hypersexualism, uh, they, they wanted to rape white women, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this was a part of this entity called scientific racism. And believe it or not, it wasn't until 2011 that the guy in the middle here, a Harvard scientist, actually went back and repeated all these studies with appropriate controls and showed the whole thing was bogus. The only thing that relates the size of your head and your brain is how tall you are and uh, doesn't have anything to do with your race. So all of this stuff was incorporated into teaching in medical schools and colleges, uh, even in, in the East uh, for many, many years and formed the basis of scientific racism. In the next uh, slide, you will see see um, a picture of Josiah Clark Knott. Is that, is that the one that comes up for you next? Mm -hmm. uh, no, Clark. it's the uh, Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. Oh, okay. Well, the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal 
uh, was the, I mentioned the New England Journal, one of our best journals. That was the former, uh, the New England Journal was originally the Boston Medical Journal. And what you see is a, an article that was published in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal uh, uh, in 1843. And if you look down there, it says uh, uh, J, it's supposed to be J.C. Knott. The original article's on your right little box, and my uh, secretary typed this where you could read it. And so Knott was in practice in Mobile. After being educated at Penn, he uh, moved to Mobile to start his practice because he was from a big family of males, and he was a second or third son, and he had to get out. He wasn't going to get the plantation. So he came to Mobile and, and sorted out uh, and uh, started a medical practice. And he uh, had spent time with Morton and was, uh, and, and so this, this was his first publication in a scientific journal, which was, you know, the predecessor of the New England Journal of Medicine. And you look down the bottom in bold, you'll see that he, he, he concluded from his own studies, not from skulls, but from studies in his clinic. He had a clinic for uh, African slaves uh, sponsored by their uh, uh, masters who sent them in if they became ill. And he had a separate clinic for mulattoes who were mixed race. Uh, and there were large numbers of mulattoes in Mobile and uh, uh, in New Orleans. The reason for that is, is that the slave owners uh, who uh, were very much anti-misogynistic were actually raping slave women in large numbers, and there were large numbers of mixed race uh, uh, people uh, being born, and they usually sold those people uh, as house slaves uh, and many became freed to large towns like Mobile and uh, uh, New Orleans where they could get them off the plantation and cover up what had happened. So there were a large number of these mixed race uh, African Americans uh, in Mobile and he studied them in his clinic and uh, made these conclusions that they were intermediate intelligence since they were part black and part white he concluded from his observations that they, they had less intelligence than whites, uh, more intelligence than blacks, and we're in the middle there, and uh, a bunch of other crazy things like this that he published in the scientific journal, which added to this body of information called, called uh, scientific racism. So the next picture shows his, uh, um, shows his uh, biography that was written. Uh, uh, it's a new biography uh, that is very good and a picture of him and in Mobile. And it also shows a uh, set of lectures that he gave at the Alabama Medical College in Mobile, which I'll talk about in just a second. But after his book was published, he and um, he and uh, uh, Morton became big buddies. He also became part of a larger group of uh, anthropologists in the country, and he became a major uh, pro-slavery spokesman uh, in medical schools. He, he was on the Tulane faculty for a while. He traveled all over the country giving lectures, and he wrote two huge books that were very, very popular. His best, um, the best summary of what he thought about African Americans, next slide, uh, is on a slide titled, Not Addressed to the Southern Rights Association in Mobile in 1850. And uh, he put it all out there uh, for everybody to see. He gave this talk and then it was published. And he basically said that there were, uh, different races in, in America, primarily white, black, and red Indians. Uh, 
that uh, God allowed slavery to exist and stamped the Negro with permanent inferiority. I don't know if you know about that book, but Stamped is now number one on the bestseller list of the New York Times, a book called Stamped, which uh, talks all about all of this same material that I'm talking about, but not with a medical emphasis. He said that, uh, by the way, uh, ab abolitionists were called, called philanthropists by Southerners. And he said a false philanthropy had taken place in trying to free the slaves and that here's the biggie number four the aim of philanthropy should be to keep the white ruling race of the world as pure as possible so that uh, the races could prosper in the next slide you'll see some of the materials from his book the types of mankind which was published in 1854 it sold out four editions, and you can still buy this book uh, from Amazon, a reprint of it, so people are still buying it. Uh, and it had all these explanations of why uh, there were multiple races and how they were pure. And this first picture is a picture of people and uh, brain sizes and animals. And the next slide shows his, uh, uh, the races of man as he calculated them from uh, the various scientific uh, materials that were being used by anthropologists. These are, by the way, are some of the most beautiful illustrations I've ever seen. Uh, in, in original copies of this book. I don't know whether there's one in Mobile because most of um, the material from the Mobile Medical College came to the University of Alabama uh, after uh, the college closed. Now I'll get to that in a second. But there may be a copy at the Mobile Medical Museum, uh, but these are amazing books. Uh, and he, he obviously was an evil genius, uh, this guy not. And next slide, which shows the Mobile Medical College that he founded right before the Civil War, which subsequently became the University of Alabama School of Medicine in Mobile was moved to Tuscaloosa uh, in the 20s and became moved to Birmingham subsequently and is now the school that I'm on the faculty of, the University of Alabama uh, School of Medicine in Birmingham is this school that not founded. And he went to uh, France and got these models on the right that were used in this school and there were it was a very very good school there were two years of classes he graduated over a hundred physicians the first two years and then the civil war came and like everything all the other schools if you look at the next slide with a picture of the bullseye on it um, all of the students in uh, higher education, college, university, and some high school students uh, immediately joined, uh, ha had been members of militias during this period because there was all kinds of war talk, hate talk about the South and from the North and North from the South. And in Mobile, there was this group of militia called the Mobile Cadets. And the sons of all of the uh, VIPs and upper class folks in Mobile joined this, and one of Knott's sons joined the Mobile Connect Cadets. They were called up, and uh, subsequently, uh, and he was a physician, uh, and one and Braxton Bragg was the commander of the forces. Um, in that part of the South that fought in uh, Vicksburg uh, and most of the battles in Mississippi around Vicksburg. And uh, this knot became the uh, Surgeon General of Bragg's army during this period. So he was very active in the Civil War, subsequently ran all the hospitals uh, in Mississippi, in Alabama, 
And after the Civil War, uh, by the way, he quit the Civil War because he had a fight with Braxton Bragg. Braxton Bragg got to where, toward the end of the war, where uh, when he would catch any of his troops uh, deserting, he'd round them up in a circle and shoot them in the head. And uh, the doctor couldn't stand that. So he quit, went back to Mobile and ran hospitals. And his, ho uh, his, his uh, own personal hospital and the medical school subsequently become, became occupied by Union troops when Mobile uh, surrendered. And General Oliver uh, Howard became the head of the Reconstruction Commission that took, uh, took over the school. And uh, that school building was turned, that you saw earlier, was turned into a school for uh, freemen where they taught them to uh, make shoes and carpentry and all kinds of trade where they could support themselves. And it made uh, not so crazy. He left uh, Alabama, ended up in New York, and was on the faculty of one of the uh, New York medical schools where he helped found the specialty of obstetrics and uh, became very famous. Meanwhile, on the next slide, uh, the school moved to the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa and they named the school Knott Hall and it was only about three weeks ago that the, his name was taken off of this building uh, because of the recognition of uh, his racism in medicine. And the one on the right is UAB in Birmingham. So the next slide is titled Examples of the Downstream Effect of Scientific Racism and Bias by Physicians Against Physicians. Uh, uh, the American white physicians uh, have discriminated against black physicians uh, uh, since the get-go of organized medicine. Uh, in, the, in the period of Reconstruction, uh, the American Medical Association refused to let blacks become members uh, of that organization. And that was a big problem because the AMA uh, provided, you had to have uh, AMA membership to get hospital privileges and admit people to the hospital to get continuing education because there was no continuing education for physicians outside of the AMA. And uh, the fact that the blacks were black physicians who were coming out of uh, about 17 black medical schools that were started after the Civil War, primarily by uh, church organizations from the East Coast and black social organizations, uh, they could not get hospital privileges. And subsequently, the AMA collaborated uh, with the Carnegie Institution to send this guy Flexner to do an assessment of all the medical schools. And Flexner declared that all the black medical schools except two, Howard and Meharry, were not worth keeping and they all closed up. So blacks had only two medical schools that they could get into. When they got out of medical school, uh, they could not get hospital privileges. So all they could do was outpatient practice. When somebody got sick, they had to refer, they had to find a white doctor who would admit them to the hospital. And uh, uh, they were, uh, their, their ability to practice in a meaningful way was significantly list, uh, um, limited. The, Amer the American Association of Medical Colleges also participated in this scenario. So all of organized medicine discriminated against black physicians until the 1950s, uh, when for the first time the American Medical Association began to um, uh, admit that they were keeping them out of medical association. That did not clear up until after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, when Medicare required uh, physicians 
uh, ho all hospitals receiving Medicare reimbursement to be desegregated. So that's when all these things changed. And in 2008, in 2008, the American Medical Association finally apologized for their racism. And now we're cleaning up the mess that has been left uh, because we have very few black physicians. Black physicians will practice in rural areas uh, with large black minority populations and white doctors won't go there. Uh, so the access to care for black, uh, black patients is very limited in Alabama and Mississippi. And we're trying to generate uh, more minority physicians. At UAB, we're up to 14% of our uh, class, this year's class, are minorities. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, University of Mississippi Medical Center is close or better than that because they've been very uh, working hard, hard to keep uh, talented minority students in the state. They, uh, Harvard and the other very rich medical schools have always picked off our very best minority students and given them full scholarships to their medical programs in Boston and Philadelphia and elsewhere, and they never come back to our state. So we never have enough black physicians or physicians of other colors, now Hispanics and so forth, to practice. The, the next slide shows the downstream effects of scientific racism and bias uh, on patients. Uh, you're aware of the Tuskegee syphilis study in which uh, black physicians, uh, black uh, males who had syphilis were divided into two groups, one who received treatment and one who didn't. And of course, the long-term effects of syphilis are heart disease and dementia. Uh, there were large numbers of African-Americans excluded from the U.S. Uh, military uh, during World War II uh, by bogus physical examinations that we physicians performed on behalf of the Army. Uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff, including the eugene, eugenic movement uh, in Alabama. We incarcerated large numbers of uh, people in our insane asylums. By the way, there was an insane asylum where UMNC was, and they did the same thing during this period. Uh, um, um, eugenics took large numbers of people who had behavior disorders and locked them up. They sterilized uh, people, black and white, and all kinds of other uh, problems uh, occurred from that. So the next to the last slide is a picture of the Magnolia Cemetery in Mobile, one of my favorite places to visit. And this is the Knott family. Uh, uh, Knott, uh, lost two of his sons uh, in the Civil War, uh, one at Chickamauga uh, and another, both in Mississippi. And that's his statue to his sons on the right, sacred to the memory. He had six kids and only one of them survived. Uh, uh, his daughters, uh, all of his daughters died during yellow fever epidemics in Mobile, and the little dog over there is uh, a memorial to uh, the kids with their favorite dog. It's very uh, heartbreaking, and there are monuments all over the place to his family. You can see how many were there, and then the big knot monument in the middle. Uh, he ended up coming back to uh, Mobile, and there was a big, big celebration, almost like Mardi Gras, with a parade and he was buried there. And uh, so he, his effect is still operative in American medicine. Now on the next slide, you'll see the report uh, summary uh, by Dr. Francis Collins, who's uh, chair of the, uh, of the uh, who is uh, the head of the National Institutes of Health, uh, which summarizes the uh, effects of the human genome project on scientific racism. And basically what he says in this article is a summary of the latest human genome project findings. There is only one race. There aren't multiple races. 
there's one race, the blacks are the same race that the whites are in, it's homo sapiens sapiens. The changes uh, that uh, are, are different, uh, the differences between us reflect <clears throat> our environment and normal mutation that occurs in populations and uh, our genetic makeup is 99.9% .9 the same. So although there are different ethnicities uh, because of our history, there's only one race. And racism is not a scientific concept. And uh, despite uh, all the history I gave you and all the wasted energy people put into supporting slavery and racism, uh, it is not scientific. And we're spending a lot of time right now in, in, uh, in medicine trying to get bias that is residual from all this out of, our, uh, out of our curriculum and out of our system because it is intolerable that physicians either consciously or, or, or unconsciously would discriminate against their own patients. But blacks don't trust white physicians and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. We've given them a reason and we're trying to change that. So I hope that uh, was illuminating and interesting. And most of that material is in my book, but the latest stuff on not, we've just dug out. So I hope I brought you up to date. That was super interesting. And I have made a lot of notes about things to, um, you know, look up and learn more about. Um, a couple of things you mentioned um, the a few weeks ago, and I was about to Google it to find it. I saw a tweet that said that um, it's a new study. Black babies who are in the care of white physicians have a much worse uh, fatality rate than if they are cared for by black physicians. Yes, I saw that. That's um, the same thing. I mean, uh, we, we, because of our bias, see black patients of less value than white patients. And so when a baby, uh, uh, and f first of all, black babies um, uh, tend to have a lot of medical problems because they don't get prenatal care as much as whites do. And blacks, black physicians, I think we think the explanation of that is that uh, black physicians don't give up on black babies as quick as white ones do. Hmm. Mind boggling. Well, it, it, when, when you hear a historical uh, summary of disparities, it's, it's shocking and upsetting, but when it's a contemporary study, it's even more so. Um, but um, a couple of things, you mentioned that there's an asylum, uh, there was uh, an insane asylum on the grounds of UMMC, and that's the topic of our next talk on September 25th. So just bringing that together. Um, one thing in your book, again, The Racial Divide in American Medicine, if anyone's interested, um, you, you, the part I read that was really fascinating to me is about the Freedmen's Hospitals. Um, in Reconstruction. Can you tell us a little, you know, just a snippet about that and, and what their, the, I guess the part I'm getting to is that it was wonderful that they were there, but then the reason that they were taken away. Yeah, the, the uh, there were, uh, Mississippi probably got more dollars out of the Freedmen's programs than any, anyone else. Actually, Jefferson Davis had set up a slave hospital on his uh, property at Davis Bend uh, and uh, in Mississippi. And the, num uh, the Freedman's Hospital number one is now the hospital of Howard University in Washington. Freedman's Hospital number two was the Davis Bend Hospital that was turned into a federal slave hospital that operated uh, during Reconstruction. And there were a number of other ones uh, around there. So uh, th there, there were a lot of union physicians who were brought into uh, the South to take care of blacks because they basically 
were just abandoned at the end of the war. I mean, that you know, three million people just wandering around trying to figure out what next. Uh, the lucky ones got on trains and went to Chicago and Detroit and places like that, but the rest were, you know, literally destitute. And so the Freedmen's Bureau set up feeding stations, uh, health care systems, clinics, and hospitals uh, throughout uh, the Confederacy, most dense uh, in um, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, where the need was the largest. And uh, those hospitals were closed uh, after uh, Johnson took over uh, the presidency after Lincoln's assassination. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau was closed because of the uh, return of Southern legislatures, legislators who are very, remain very angry about losing the war and they blocked funding for it and it ended up closing and all those people were withdrawn. And after that took place, the Medical College of Alabama and Mobile reopened and stayed open for another, I think, 30 years or so uh, as an independent medical school. So th that had to do with the politics. In fact, um, I mentioned that Flexner report that uh, ended up closing black medical schools The the and also the decision to stop and to refuse medical, uh, refuse membership in the AMA, a, a uh, Southern general, a physician general, uh, led the committee that refused to let black physicians be a member of the AMA. So after the war, there was a great uh, uh, attempt to reincorporate uh, Southerners into uh, American life and a lot of compromises made that had unexpe unexpected long-term uh, consequences. Um, one other thing that I, in your book, you um, talk about Bobby Kennedy's trip to the Delta and how, what, how that had an effect on the public's and the government's perception of um, hunger and malnutrition. Um, that was another topic of one of our other lecture series. So um, if you saw that one about Delta Epiphany uh, yeah. by Ellen Meacham, you'll want to also read Dr. DeShazo's book to get more information about that. Yeah, Ellen, Ellen helped me with some of that information. She was writing her book at the same time I was writing mine. And uh, her, her book is, is, I have several copies of it. I keep losing copies of books I buy. So I have multiple copies of the same book and hers is one of them. <laughs> hey, that, that works. Yeah. Um, uh, the only other thing I had written down that I wanted you to, to tell us about uh, it sounds like such a great concept for a moment there that um, southern states would uh, send their um, send that have scholarships to send black uh, medical students out of state. That sounds like a great thing. Well, until you read more <laughs> about why they did that. Yeah, they uh, the southern governors actually came up uh, formed an association, the Southern Governors Conference. And uh, all of the Southern governors were, uh, were facing the same problem. Uh, and that was that blacks were trying to get into their uh, colleges uh, and universities. And, uh, and the Supreme Court kept ruling uh, that they had to let them in, but they kept stalling, taking, appealing, changing the rules and, uh, and then uh, stalling. And one way they decided to handle this was uh, many of the, these applicants were to medical schools or white, all white medical schools. And so they developed a mechanism to identify, uh, and this was very active in Mississippi, just about every black physician in Mississippi, uh, including Dr. Smith, who is still living uh, in Jackson, uh, were offered scholarships 
to either Meharry or Howard, uh, uh, where they would not go to white, apply to white medical schools because they knew that sooner or later one was going to get in. And so they had these free rides to Meharry. Of course, most of them did not come back they were supposed to come back for uh, two to three years to do a payback on this. Many didn't come back at all. A lot of, a lot of them went to uh, San Francisco in, in California for some reason. I don't know why so many. The biggest Meharry alumni group was in California. Uh, but the ones who did come back usually left. And there were a few that stayed, and, and those were folks like Robert Smith and uh, Shirley, uh, who was an icon and Anderson, uh, all of these were Jackson physicians, uh, and, uh, uh, several on the, on the coast. And they're all mentioned in the book. You're back. Oh, we have, we've been, I, I'm sorry that you have not been able to see us this whole time or your slides. I've been hard at work. <laughs> I'm glad you had a copy of your slides. That would have been a disaster uh, had had that not happened. Wait, so um, where do we go? Are all of these other talks that you've referred to that people will want? Those are all on your website, right? They're all on. If you what just if you Google address? the Mississippi Library Commission and YouTube, you will land on our channel, and all of those were under our summer lunch lecture series. So you can you can find them all there. Looks like I got some homework. You have some um, some viewing to do this weekend. Yes. Um, well, look, we appreciate your time. We're going to give away a copy of, of your book, and Mary Rogers is going to unmute herself and announce the winner. She's been tallying who's here and randomly generating a, a name. Yes, and our winner is from Facebook, and it is Carrie Ann Pearson. So, so Carrie Ann, if you will send us a Facebook message with your mailing address, we'll get you that book. And um, anyone else who wants a copy of the book, it's now in paperback. Um, Dr. Gachezo said, if you if you want to order a hundred copies, it's discounted. <laughs> but I'm guessing people only need one. Um, <laughs> but it's also available at the Library Commission, um, which I will now return, and someone can check it out now. Um, so if you're interested in that, please let us know. But again, thank you for um, doing this talk for us. And um, we have a long way to go in terms of this topic. And I appreciate you um, shedding light on it. Well, thanks for inviting me. And thanks for folks for listening. I enjoyed visiting with you. Hope you'll um, ask me again. I will. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.